Hi there, Michael Burnett, AF7KB, that fast track ham license guy, and this is the Smith Chart. Put simply, Smith Charts are about simplifying transmission line math. See, Philip Smith was a researcher at Bell Labs, where he went to work in 1928. He had a special interest in transmission lines and matching them to antennas. Now, in those days, this was a really tedious problem involving a lot of physically challenging measurements. I mean, they had to go out and actually take the temperature of operating transmission lines. He just knew there had to be a better way. The Smith chart was the better way. By 1936 or thereabouts, he had developed the beginnings of what we now know as the Smith chart as an easy way to get to what would otherwise be the results of vast volumes of calculations on one chart. He worked out a way to represent resistance, capacitive reactance, inductive reactance, impedance, SWR, frequency, transmission line length, and all their interrelationships all on one chart. Solving complex transmission line problems went from lots and lots of tedious slide rule calculations, remember, no computers in those days, to tracing a few lines on a chart and maybe using a compass to draw a circle. Smith went on to contribute to the development of radar, and you can also thank him for high-power coaxial lines and the adjustable stub tuner, among other things. Okay, here comes the only scary part of the whole video, your first look at an actual Smith chart. Do not panic. Remember, it makes things easier. All right, here it comes. There it is. The actual chart used in the exam is a vastly simplified version of the illustration, but I want you to see what the real chart looks like with all the parts. At TV resolution, the numbers on this one probably are not going to be legible, but don't sweat that. The important thing is to learn the parts of the chart and what the chart represents. There isn't a single question on the exam that asks you to solve a numerical problem with the Smith chart. Now, assuming you haven't run out of the room screaming, let's take this thing apart piece by piece. We'll start with the big circle around the outside. The axes on a Smith chart aren't like the straight lines we're used to on graph paper, nor are they like the radial lines of a polar coordinates chart. The Smith chart axes are circles and parts of circles. Now, that big circle around the outside, that's the reactance axis, and any point on it represents a particular reactance. Then we'll add an axis right across the center that represents resistance. No capacitive reactance, no inductive reactance, just pure resistance. It runs from zero ohms on the left, that's a short circuit, to infinite ohms on the far right, which would be an open circuit. Now that's the only straight line on the whole chart. Now, that's all well and good, except we seldom have circuits with zero or infinite resistance. Neither of those is a very useful circuit. So there are more circles to represent constant real-world values of resistance. They all intersect that infinite resistance point on the right. I know they don't look like they do, because other circles get in the way, but they do. Here are a few that are highlighted. Now, there's another set of circles on the chart, but we only see part of the arcs of those circles because the rest of the arcs, the values, would be impossible. So let's get rid of the parts that are literally off the chart <laughs> and make a little more room. Those are the reactance arcs. The reactance arcs in the top half of the chart, above the resistance axis, represent inductive reactants. The arcs in the bottom half are capacitive reactants. Now, for complicated reasons we don't need to go into, all the values on the chart are one-fiftieth of the real values. 
values. So the 1.0 in the middle of the resistance axis equals 50 ohms. We say the chart is normalized to 50 ohms. Now, because the chart is normalized to 50 ohms, we also have to normalize all the values we plug into it. It's very simple. Just divide everything by 50. I'll demonstrate in a bit. With values plugged in, the Smith chart becomes something very much like an old-fashioned slide rule. In fact, there was a time you could even buy slide rule versions of the chart with a cursor that would spin around the center. Now, you are now armed with at least 90% of the knowledge about Smith charts that you need to pass your extra exam. But we've come this far. We might as well take a quick look at how the thing actually works. We'll start with a simple example. And this is just for the purposes of seeing the anatomy of this thing in action. This isn't, here's how to operate the Smith chart machine. This is, here's generally this machine and what it looks like in operation. Let's say we want to attach a load to our 50 ohm coax, and we know the resistance and the reactance of the load, those same values that we use to create a phasor diagram. What we want to know is what the SWR will be with that setup. Now, to keep numbers simple, let's say our load has a 50 ohm resistance and 50 ohms of inductive reactance. Now, formally, those are coordinates of 50 and plus J50. Step one is to normalize our values. We divide the resistance and the reactance by the normalizing number of the chart, which is 50. That gives us coordinates of 1 and plus J1. Next, we plot the resistance point on the resistance axis. It's easy enough to find. 1.0 is smack dab in the center of the resistance axis. Next, we grab a gigantic number two pencil and trace the resistance circle that crosses the resistance axis at that 1.0 point. That circle shows a resistance of 1.0 normalized ohms at every point. It doesn't really mean much of anything yet, though. We still need to figure the reactance point. So we're going to add the reactance point on the reactance axis. And the reactance axis is that circle that marks the outside border of the chart. Now again, you probably can't see the numbers, but there are tiny little numbers showing the values just outside that outer border. Negative numbers are on the bottom half of the chart. Those are the capacitive reactances, the minus J numbers. Our reactance is a plus J, so we'll look on the top half of the chart. And there it is, 1.0. Next, we trace that reactance arc with our gigantic number two pencil. Every point on that arc has a reactance of plus J1. That spot where the resistance arc and the reactance arc meet is the normalized impedance of our load, which we can read on the chart as, as, uh, well, the chart doesn't tell us the impedance in ohms, but we know that's a simple calculation anyway, and that wasn't our question. We wanted to know something a little more practical. What will the SWR be? That point where the arcs meet is just like the point on our phasor diagram triangle where the hypotenuse meets the opposite side. It's that point right there. We grab our handy compass. No, not that kind, this kind. We put the point of the compass right in the center of the chart at 1.0 on the resistance scale. Then we set the pencil part of the compass on the impedance point and we draw a circle. What we have added is called a standing wave ratio circle. We read the SWR on the resistance scale and we read it on the right hand half to the right of 1.0 because there's no such thing as an SWR of less than 1 to 1. I read it as 2.6 to 1. 
Now, that's just an example of one thing you can do with a Smith chart. Just like a slide rule, there are way more things you can calculate using a Smith chart. In fact, you can buy whole books on using the Smith chart to solve far more complex problems than the one we just saw. Finally, you should know that there are also two wavelength scales on the Smith chart. They run around the outside of the reactant's axis, and they're calibrated in fractions of transmission line electrical wavelength. That's one of the questions on the exam, you need to know that. There are two scales, because one runs clockwise around the circle, and that's for measuring wavelengths toward a generator. In most cases, that means a transmitter. And the other is for wavelengths toward a load. Now, if you're planning to take the extra exam soon, the Smith chart does have at least one potential near-term practical application for you. In the fast track to your extra class ham radio license, I show you how to use a super simplified Smith chart to make short and simple work of solving a bunch of problems like what impedance does a one quarter wavelength transmission line present to a generator when the line is open at the far end. Okay, subscribe to the channel, visit the fasttrackham.com website, by all means, like our Facebook page, and Thanks for watching. 7-3.